As our listeners know, we are a podcast about American presidential history, but we also love history in general. And I really believe that when historians decades from now talk about our time, inevitably they'll talk about Vladimir Putin and the enormous impact he's had. So that's why we're focusing on him in this episode. And it's not hard to become fascinated by Russia. There's that famous quote by Winston Churchill that Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. And that's why we have Brian Taylor, professor of political science at Syracuse University. He's the author of the book, The Code of Putinism. Full disclosure, he was my grad school professor at Syracuse, and I loved his class on civil-military relations. It was one of the best classes I've ever taken. And I'm not just saying that because uh, he's my, he was my professor and he's on the call right now. So welcome, Professor Taylor. Thanks for being here. Happy to be here, Richard. Yes. Yeah, so as a civ mill professor, how did you get interested in Russia in particular and what led you to write this book? So my interest in Russia is fairly longstanding. I started to get interested in what was then the Soviet Union during the uh, Reagan era and during the sort of rise of what has sometimes been called the Second Cold War, the the period after detente in the 1980s. And a professor of mine suggested that I start studying Russian, as well as keeping up with the study of military and security affairs. And so that's where it all started. And so over the years, I've worked both on security issues and Russia issues. But there's something about Vladimir Putin that made me think I wanted to write an entire book about him. Sure. So you call the book, the title of the book is Code of Putin. Why did you give it that title? So the title is actually a reference to a famous book written in the early 1950s about the Soviet system about under Lenin and Stalin called the operational code of Bolshevism. And so I stole the word code and applied it to Putinism as a system. Hmm. So you used a quote that says the law appealed to Putin as martial arts did. How are the law and martial arts similar in Putin's eyes? So I think in Putin's eyes, the thing that unites the law and the martial arts are this notion of order and control. So his interest in martial arts started when he was uh, a young man, actually, you know, a kid. Uh, and he described himself before he got interested in martial arts as a bit of a street thug. And he says the martial arts is what taught him self-discipline and self-control. And I think he also saw in the law as a subject of study something in which there are sort of rules and order and, you know, kind of the place for a firm hand to assert itself. And that's what the law was to him, which is in some ways similar to how he saw the martial arts. Hmm. So one phrase that you discuss is manual control and uh, I believe Putin has talked about the need for manual control of Russian society and institutions. What did he mean by this? Yeah, so this came from a quote of Putin back in 2007 when he was asked about what was coming to the end of his first two terms a as president. And as everyone will recall, he stepped aside from the presidency for four years while Dmitry Medvedev was president because of the constitutional limit on more than two consecutive terms. And he was asked about his achievements and the system of rule he constructed. And, and he said that Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, had come out of a deep crisis and its institutions weren't really functioning. So it needed a system of manual control or manual steering to make things work. And I think what this meant for him was that he did not have faith either in the existing political institutions or even one might say the maturity of Russian society to govern Russia without a strong hand from the center, making sure that everything is working the way he saw fit. And in this interview, he was asked, well, how long will Russia need this system of manual control? And he said, well, about 15 or 20 years. So if we count forward, we're somewhere into the, this decade, right, the decade of the 2020s in which he thinks we're going to need, we meaning Russia, Russia will need manual control. Hmm. Has he said anything recently about that? Well, it's interesting because when they earlier this year amended the Russian constitution to make it possible for him to serve 
in more than two consecutive terms. The main argument that was made by the people pushing this, at least publicly, was that Russia faced many challenges. Russia still faces a very tough international system. And so we needed to have some stability at the top. So in some sense, they're still making the same argument for Putin's manual control to persist well into the next decade. Hmm. So one thing I thought was surprising, and others might find surprising, you discuss how Putin has been described by friends as an emotional person. What do you mean by this? Yeah, so this is a story that one of his good friends from uh, Leningrad at the time, now St. Petersburg, told about him back in his campaign biography in 2000 when he was first running for president. And the guy's name is Sergei Roldugin. He's actually a cellist. And Roldugin was asked about Putin and Putin's career in the KGB. And he sort of said, well, you know, he was always kind of an emotional guy, but he couldn't really express his emotions well. But now after the training he's had from the KGB, he's much better at expressing his emotions. And I think that's a really interesting insight that many people might miss. He sort of seems very rigidly controlled and very kind of cool and rational. Uh, but I think there is a, a real strong emotional sort of undercurrent to the way Putin sees and experiences the world. And that's one of the things I talk about as, as part of this code, the emotional part. And it has to do with things like feelings about how Russia and the Soviet Union were humiliated, resentment against how they were treated by the West, uh, a feeling of vulnerability about Russia, both in the international system and in terms of domestic political institutions. And so I think he's not simply a rational sort of utility maximizing actor the way economists like to think all of us are. I think he's got these other elements, including the emotional one that helps inform the decisions that he makes. Hmm. So you uh, brought up the resentment uh, that he feels towards what happened to Russia, the humiliation. Uh, can you explain that? And how do Russians feel betrayed by what happened during, say, the 90s uh, with the fall of the Soviet Union and the post uh, fall of the Soviet Union era? Sure. So Putin once famously referred to the collapse of the Soviet Union as the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century. And I think the word there that's really most important to him is geopolitical. So in one day when the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia lost a quarter of its territory that had been part of it historically under the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. It lost about 40% of its economy and it lost almost half of its population because of the 14 other republics of the Soviet Union becoming independent. So he saw this as a huge blow to Russia's standing in the world. And one of the most important things to Vladimir Putin, something he's really focused on as president, is restoring Russia as one of the most important great powers in the world. And so after the collapse of the Soviet Union, people weren't really sure if Russia would be able to persist as a great power, given all the problems it was facing, given the losses I just discussed, given the economic problems of transitioning from a market or from a command economy to a market economy. And so his view and the view of many of the Russian elites is that during this period, the West did not treat fairly with Russia, that it sort of remade the international system in the way that the United States favored and left Russia out and ignored Russian interest and basically did not respect Russia in decisions it made about international politics. And he wanted to put Russia in a position where that could no longer happen again. Right. And I'd read that Russia had lost half its GDP during the 90s. And uh, I, I was assuming that that was Russia alone as opposed to the rest of the Soviet Union. Well, it actually was. So mm -hmm. that's why the collapse was so severe. First of all, when the Soviet collapse happened, Russia had about 60 percent of the national wealth of the Soviet Union, but the other 40 percent belonged to the other 14 republics. And then from that much lower base, because of the depression they experienced really from 1990 until about 1999, they lost another 50 percent of their GDP. Now, there are reasons to think that those numbers might exaggerate the extent of the collapse, but it's still obviously the case that Russia, along with most of the post-Soviet space and much of the post-communist world 
went through a serious economic repression in the 1990s. Yeah, that's astonishing. I mean, it's a greater decline than what America experienced during our Great Depression. And you're probably familiar with stories of that. I had a friend actually over there at Syracuse University, and she had lived through Uh, she's Russian, so she lived through that. And she told me, literally, they had nothing to eat in the 90s, maybe just bread. (laughs) It's astonishing. Yeah, and it wasn't because that there weren't goods available in the stores. It was simply because people couldn't afford it because they weren't getting their salaries. They might continue working in a factory, but the factory had no money coming in. So people would just keep working without getting paid. It was an unimaginable kind of situation. So Hmm. once they opened up the economy, goods did pour in. uh, But the question was who could afford them and not everyone could afford them. So many people remember that time as a very difficult and bleak period for Russia. Right. Now, uh, we talked a little bit about Putin's uh, suspicion of the West. Was there anything the West and the United States specifically could have done to not provoke suspicion during that time? That's a huge question that is much debated among specialists. Many people, for example, blame the poor relations on the NATO decision to expand NATO into the East. And that certainly was something that many uh, Russians, especially Russian elites, saw as uh, a problem that threatened Russia. Other people point to the economic reforms that Russia pursued in the 1990s and said that the reason the economy did so poorly was because the U.S. and the West deliberately gave bad advice. I don't actually think that's true. I think the economic collapse was in some ways an inevitable consequence of moving from one economic system to a completely different model. And if we look at Russia compared to its neighbors, its performance was kind of average in the 90s. Everyone did badly. So it wasn't like the U.S. advice was in some sense causing a problem that in some ways was more systemic than about any particular policies. And then there were things like the U.S. decision to withdraw from the ABM Treaty, the U.S. war in Iraq, a whole list of things. And if you were to talk to Vladimir Putin about this, he has a very long list of things. But it all amounts to, in their minds, the U.S. doing what it wanted without taking into account the interests of other great powers, including Russia. Hmm. So, uh, and I guess one's opinion of of that, the legitimacy of those actions, uh, that's its own separate issue. So, Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, sure, the West could have done some things differently, Mm -hmm. but I don't think there was any way for Russia to avoid a sort of crisis situation after the collapse of the Soviet Union. I, I think that's the major driver of the problems Russia faced. And regardless of policies pursued either by the Russian government or by Western advisors or Western countries, there was going to be that problem. Now, yes, the U.S. probably could have done some things differently. And I think probably in the foreign policy realm, more efforts should have been made to incorporate Russia in some ways. But things were done like the NATO-Russia Council. But Russia always felt that those things were too little to really match what they perceive their status to be or should be in the international system. Mm -hmm. So uh, one uh, comparison you make, uh, well, one comparison is often made to Putin is that he's a Bond villain, but you've actually talked about how he he doesn't see himself as a Bond villain. Uh, Could you unpack that? Sure. So one Russian journalist, a guy named Mikhail Zigar, he said in an interview with a Western uh, journalist that You know, all of you guys think Putin is this Bond villain, and Putin likes that. He likes being seen that way and having that kind of aura around him. And I argue in the book that that's not really the right way of thinking about it, that the bad guy doesn't really think they're the bad guy. The bad guy thinks they're the hero. And so I think that Putin sees himself not as the Bond villain Blofeld, you know, conspiring to blow up the world, but as the Bond super spy, you know, doing what he can to protect his country and make his country stronger and safer. So I don't think this perception of him as this sort of dark figure manipulating the world is how he would see his role in the world at all. I think he would say that he is fighting to maintain the position that Russia deserves in the system against the threats that are coming at Russia from outside and especially 
from the West and the United States in particular. Mm -hmm. So much has been made of Putin seeing any type of democracy promotion by the United States or demonstrations in Russia or places like Ukraine as American conspiracies to undermine uh, Russian sovereignty. To what extent do you think that this is him playing up that threat for his own domestic standing, or is it based on intelligence that he gets, or maybe both? So this is something that's oft debated when people like Putin or other people around him, like the head of the Security Council or the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service, starts talking about how the U.S. is promoting color revolutions in places like Ukraine or Belarus or Kyrgyzstan or wherever, do they really mean it or is it just for domestic consumption? And I'm one of those observers who comes down with the view that, no, they really mean it. They really believe that the United States is up to no good in its neighborhood and deliberately mm -hmm. uses what we would call democracy promotion. They would perceive as regime change, externally sponsored regime change. So I think if we look at just a series of statements that have been made both on the record and in private settings, it, it seems pretty clear to me that this is a deeply held view among what I would call Team Putin. So Putin and the people uh, and the group of people around him that help make Russian foreign and security policy. I, I think this is a genuinely held view. It's hard to, uh, you know, persuade them otherwise, regardless of what policy the United States pursues. And they may play it up for domestic consumption at times, but at root, I think it's something that they are generally worried about. And I think that Putin really doesn't believe in spontaneous revolution. He thinks if people come out into the streets, it's not because they have grievances that they want to protest. It's because someone tricked them into being there. I see it. You see, so you're saying it's kind of the lens with which they interpret all the intelligence or information that they do have. That's right. And I think the intelligence services deliberately play that up. I think that is the lens through which the people at the top of the Russian intelligence system see the world. And they also understand that that's the lens which Putin himself has. So they, in some sense, are telling him what they think the world presents, and they're doing it in a way that appeals to the way he sees the world. It also sometimes helps them make excuses, one might say, for their poor intelligence. So, for example, when the events in Ukraine in 2013-2014 happened around Euromaidan, Russia was caught by surprise. And I would guess that there were questions to, for example, the Federal Security Service. What are you hearing on the ground? Why did you not see this coming? And it's easy for them to point to the evil Americans stirring up trouble rather than to admit that their intelligence network wasn't picking up on signals that the Ukrainian streets might develop in this direction. Hmm. So you discuss how Russian elites, governing elites, did not like President Obama. And it's famous that he uh, had a grudge against Hillary Clinton. How did this come about? And just briefly, if you can give the impression that uh, leaders in Putin's government have on the last few presidents of the United States. Sure. So starting with Obama, and then I'll work through some of the other ones, I think it's important to remember that when Obama first became the U.S. president, the Russian president was not Vladimir Putin, it was Dmitry Medvedev. And the United States had pursued this policy that the U.S. called the reset, and trying to find common ground for agreements with Russia. And some important steps were taken. The New START Treaty that's in the news now because it's about to expire was negotiated between Obama and Medvedev. There was the resupply of U.S. troops in Afghanistan through Russia that was called the Northern Distribution Network. There was progress on the deal about Iran's nuclear program and a series of other issues. And I think it was clear to Putin that Obama and Medvedev had this connection, and he felt, I think, that the United States was sort of taking advantage of Medvedev a bit. You saw that, especially with respect to the Arab Spring and the resolution in the UN Security Council about Libya, in which Medvedev chose to abstain, and then Gaddafi ends up getting overthrown. That people often point to as one of the events that took place in 2011 that convinced Putin for sure that he had to come back as president. 
And so he announces he's coming back as president. And then when they have the parliamentary elections a few months before presidential elections, there's this rigged election in which United Russia, the pro-Putin party, uh, is given really more votes than it actually received legitimately. And that's called out by the United States, including Hillary Clinton. And Russia has the largest street demonstrations it had had since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And Putin blamed that on Clinton and Obama. So when he came in to office again in 2012, after spending four years as prime minister, he was already negatively disposed towards Obama, both in terms of the foreign policies the U.S. had pursued and this belief that the U.S. was behind the protests in Russia. Hmm. So, uh, oh, and then uh, you were going to talk about leaders like President Bush and other other presidents. Mm-hmm. Sure. So uh, in terms of Donald Trump, I think Putin and the, the people around him had some hopes that the Trump that said he was going to become, you know, best friends with Russia and with, with Putin during the campaign would actually deliver something of value to them. And they worked on that for a few years and they came around to the view that Trump really couldn't deliver. And they blamed it on what is sometimes referred to as, you know, the deep state, the national security state in the United States, where I think there's fairly consistent view across people in places like the CIA and the Department of Defense and the State Department about Russia and about what Russia is up to in the world that differs from the way uh, Trump talks about it. But we also have a Congress, both the Republicans and Democrats, who by and large are more suspicious of, of Putin and Russia's actions than Trump is. So it turned out that the Russians, the Russians may feel that they didn't uh, quite get what they hoped to out of the Trump relationship. Uh, in terms of Putin's relationship with George W. Bush, uh, again, they tried to establish good relations right at the beginning when they were both first starting as president. And there was that famous episode in which Bush said he looked into Putin's soul, looked into his eyes and saw his soul. Uh, but things there quickly went south. There was an effort by Putin after 9-11 to build this counterterrorism coalition with the United States. But once the United States sort of shifted from Afghanistan to the war in Iraq, that's where they parted company. And in some sense, Putin felt that the Bush administration was using the war on terror to advance U.S. interests rather than what Putin saw as global interests. So by the time the Bush presidency ended, U.S.-Russia relations were kind of at – Uh, a pretty low point. And the Bush presidency ended with the Russian war against Georgia in August 2008. So that's when the reset comes and we we see the relationship between Obama and Medvedev and then Obama and Putin develop. Hmm. So uh, conversely, how does Putin look at Russian history, particularly the Soviet era, Lenin, Stalin? uh, People talk about Putin uh, perhaps accurately or not accurately as a Russian nationalist? How does he look at the communist era and then also with the more recent leaders like Gorbachev and Yeltsin? Sure. So Putin has an actually rather mixed view of Soviet history. He, I don't think, is particularly sympathetic to what Lenin and Stalin did in terms of their policies, although Putin himself was a member of the Communist Party, because anyone hoping to rise in the ranks in the KGB would have to be a member of the party. But I think his view of Russian history is more of one long interconnected story about Russia as a great empire and Russia as a great power. And he wants to sort of subsume the Soviet period into this longer narrative, setting aside the communist part setting aside the purges and the great terror and all that, and instead tell a story about Russian achievement, whether it's in World War II, whether it's in space or whatever. So I think that's his view of history. And he's been quite critical of Lenin in particular because of some decisions that were made in the early 1920s about how territory was redistributed when they created the Soviet Union and So he's been critical of that. The one Soviet leader that he's more positive towards, at least publicly, is Yuri Andropov, who only was general secretary of the Communist Party for less than two years, but had previously before that been head of the KGB. And I think Putin is one of those 
people who sort of regrets that Andropov didn't have more time. The theory is that Andropov would have managed maintaining political control while reforming the economy, kind of a Chinese miracle scenario. I actually don't think that's particularly realistic, uh, but that's sort of the way he's perceived as someone who would have kept the system and the country together while making it more competitive. In terms of Mikhail Gorbachev and uh, Boris Yeltsin, he has always been, he, Putin, has always been careful to not be too critical of them. And of course, he worked for Yeltsin in the 1990s, and Yeltsin was the one who appointed him to the top position. So he was never directly critical of Yeltsin, but some of the things he has said about about the 1990s implies that he thinks Yeltsin didn't do a very good job and didn't pursue the right policies. And Mikhail Gorbachev, I think he probably, along with many others, finds him in some ways responsible for the Soviet collapse, even though because Gorbachev is still with us and Gorbachev in some ways was sympathetic to Putin early on, they have maintained a cordial public relationship. But I think Probably privately, if I had to guess, Putin was not so impressed with Gorbachev's leadership because of the ultimate result. Hmm. So focusing on Putin's management side, you've alluded to quotes that he doesn't like to make decisions and likes to put off tough decisions. And uh, reminds me a little bit of Brezhnev, uh, at least the image of, of how Brezhnev governed. How has this affected policy and governance in Russia? So there are some policy areas where Putin sees himself as the main decider, and he pays a lot of attention to those. Those are obviously mostly in the foreign policy realm, having to do with military matters, nuclear matters, and also both internationally and domestically, the energy realm. He pays a lot of attention to the energy realm. But there are a lot of other decisions that have to be made in Russia, and he obviously can't make all of them. And there are certain policy areas he doesn't seem particularly interested in. So he kind of you know, lets people sort of pursue initiatives around him, and he will avoid sort of indicating exactly which way he wants to go for quite a long time. So I, I guess I would say that the system is structured because of this manual control impulse that many people want to push things up to Putin, but he doesn't want all the things that are pushed up to him to come to him. He wants some of those to be decided by other people. So you've got this bizarre situation in which lower level officials want to check and see if the top boss is okay with what they want to do. And the top boss is thinking, well, why don't you figure this out on your own? This is not a matter that should rise to my level. And that's why the decision-making process is sometimes quite slow and quite ineffective. So he can act quickly on something like Crimea when he feels there's a real threat that he needs to respond to. But on a lot of other issues that come across his desk, he's in no hurry and is hoping someone else will solve the problem for him. Hmm. Which issues would you say he's most focused on as opposed to those he kind of delegates? So the ones he's focused on, I already mentioned, especially foreign policy and security policy, military issues, nuclear arms control issues, energy policy, both directly inside Russia as well as a, as a matter of foreign policy, things like pipelines and things like that. He's very focused on those kinds of issues. And I think most people who watch Russia closely think his tendency towards the foreign and the international has grown over time, that maybe when he first became president, he had a lot of initiatives he wanted to pursue to, quote unquote, fix the problems in the Russian political system. But he was able to fix it to his satisfaction in his first two terms as president. And since then, he's really been more interested in other issues. So that would be things like economic reform, legal reform, social policy, those kinds of things. And part of the reason I think he's less interested in those areas is also because he doesn't see any easy solutions. In some ways, he got lucky in the early 2000s when he first came to power. He introduced a series of economic reforms, and he was really intent on that issue. And world energy prices also started to pick up at that time. And so Russia was able to pay off its debts and went through a period of 6 7% growth for eight years in a row. And then when that ran out around 2008, 2009, because of the international economic crisis, they didn't really have any 
great prescriptions to get things going without changing the economic rules of the game in ways that also had implications for domestic politics. So there's a subset of economists in Russia who think they really need to encourage entrepreneurship, encourage foreign investment, strengthen the rule of law, fight corruption. But when you start talking about fighting corruption and strengthening the rule of law, you're talking about creating a more open political system that allows for the competition between different political forces to bring a spotlight on corruption. You're talking about independent courts. But if you don't want independent courts and if you don't want an open media and you don't want more domestic political competition, it's unclear whether that economic strategy is one that you're going to embrace. It seems it's not one he's going to embrace. So he seems to just be waiting for energy prices as energy prices to do their magic again, but that hasn't happened over the last 10 years. So they're in a period of relative economic stagnation, and they have been for quite a while. Hmm. So uh, what kind of world order does Putin want? Putin believes, I think, that a 19th century style world order is one that best fits with how things should really work. And by 19th century, I mean, you would have a concert of great powers who would take the important decisions and impose those on the rest of the states in the international order. So he's been talking for the last couple of years about having a meeting, a summit of the heads of the P5 countries, so the five permanent members of the Security Council. And I think he wants to work out a new architecture for the international system that is more fair, more balanced, and gives a a bigger role to Russia and China, for example, than the West. And some of the advisors around Putin and are close to Putin have talked about a new big three. So Putin has sometimes talked favorably about the big three of, of Stalin, Churchill, and Roosevelt, and how we need to have a new big three, which would be Russia, China, and the United States, to sort of create the rules for the new international order. And it's worth emphasizing that this vision of international politics sort of says that the smaller and medium-sized states kind of have to take whatever the great powers say is right for the international order. And that's why many Western states have not been willing to embrace that kind of order where smaller countries near Russia, for example, might have to submit to Russian tutelage because they don't really matter in terms of how international politics is played. Mm-hmm. It's basically a world of of uh, like a troika between America, Russia, and China. But that troika would be those countries would have their spheres of influence and so on and so forth. Yeah, and you use the phrase uh, "Russia punching above its weight." Uh, that's something that Putin has talked about as well. Yeah, I think the phrase "punching above its weight," at least the way I use it, is meant to capture a bit of the disbalance in power between the United States and China on one hand, and Russia on the other. Now, of course, Russia is an important power in the international system. It's one of the two nuclear superpowers. Simply, its geographic location means it's close to lots of important places on the planet. But if we look at sort of the long-term drivers of international power, I think most people would point to things like demography and economics. And demographically, Russia is much smaller, as we already talked about, than the Soviet Union was, and its population is declining. So it's about 10% of China and less than half of the United States in terms of its total population, and its population is getting older. And then if we look at its economy, the Russian economy is also you know, less than a tenth of either the U.S. or the Chinese economy. If we just use exchange rate comparisons of the size of the Russian economy today, it's about the size of the New York state economy. Or if we compare it to another country, it's like Canada or South Korea or Italy. Uh, and so no one would ever think to say Canada or South Korea or Italy should be one of the big three in the international system. But Russia, because of its military power and because of its geographic reach, is sort of aspiring to that role. And that's why I think it's sort of fair to say it's punching above its weight, because in terms of the main attributes of international power, it tends to lag behind both the United States and China, at least at the moment. Hmm. So what do you make of the recent events in uh, Putin's government, specifically the constitutional changes? 
and the reshuffling of his cabinet, and also the the poisoning of opposition leader uh, Alexei Navalny. So first, in terms of the constitutional change, so Putin was in a position after he was elected to his fourth term in 2018 that by 2024 he would have to step down as president because the Russian constitution had this limit on no more than two consecutive terms. So that's how he could be president for eight years, step aside for four years, and during that four-year period, they amended the Constitution, so the presidential term is six years. So then he was elected in 2012 and in 2018. But that created the 2024 problem. What's going to happen in 2024? Is he going to step aside and let someone else rule? Is he going to change the Constitution? So the power is somewhere else in the system. So he could take on a different role, like prime minister or head of something called the state council, where he would continue to rule. Or would he extend his terms as president? And I think many of us who were watching this thought, first of all, that he had plenty of time to decide. And so nothing was going to happen in 2020. Well, that surprised us because he moved quite quickly. And he also took the crudest possible option, which is basically to say the restriction on two consecutive terms doesn't apply to Putin. Because we have a new constitution, we're going to reset the clock. And so he can start over again in 2024, which in practice means he could be president until 2036, Okay, Mm -hmm. Uh, putting him in charge of the country for 36 years, longer than Stalin, as long as Peter the Great was czar. Uh, of Russia. And that was the main point and the main impetus of the constitutional reforms. There were other reforms that were part of it, which I think also were not positive, such as greater executive branch control over the courts. But the main point of it was to give Putin the option of staying as president longer. Now, it's possible he will decide not to stay longer. At least he's not required to stay longer. And some people have argued that the reason he affected this change in the Constitution was because he understood the closer that Russia got to 2024, the more all the rest of the elite would be getting nervous and looking around and trying to figure out what was going to happen. And so he wanted to keep everyone sort of at his whim and at his control and make sure they continued to work the way he wanted to, rather than looking around for his successor. So it's at least hypothetically possible that he will decide by 2024 that it's time for him to withdraw from the presidency and put forward someone else. Uh, If I had to bet, I'd say he will probably uh, stand again in 2024, but that's just a guess at this point. Hmm. And the other issue you asked me about Alexei Navalny, the the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, uh, Putin was actually asked about this today, and he was talking about how he was the one who eventually made it possible for Navalny to leave for Germany Uh, for treatment. And he basically said, and obviously, if we'd been the ones who poisoned him, we wouldn't have let him go. Uh, He didn't say, how can you suggest such a thing? We would never consider trying to poison one of our own citizens with a banned biological weapon. He didn't say that. He just said, it wouldn't be smart for us to do that and then let him go. Uh, But I think it's hard to come to any other conclusion than either that Putin was personally responsible or that he created the conditions under which someone in his circle thought that that's what Putin wanted or that they themselves could make that decision and he would cover up their tracks. Hmm. There doesn't seem to be a very plausible story of how someone outside the Russian government would get access to Novichok, which is a closely controlled biological agent and use that uh, without the permission of the Russian state. That seems hard to believe. And so I think at a minimum, we can say the system that Putin has created and the amount of impunity for attacking members of the opposition that we've seen previously meant either that someone felt they could get away with this or that Putin himself was responsible. Hmm. So, uh, Can Putinism survive past Putin? I think Vladimir Putin certainly hopes so. And I think he has tried to arrange things at the top of Russian politics so that whoever succeeds him, whenever that happens to be, it'll be someone from within his circle that has relatively similar views and that will pursue relatively similar policies. 
On the other hand, I tend to think that whenever Putin is replaced, we're going to see a leader eventually emerge who was from a different generation, maybe doesn't have the same kind of emotional investment in what happened with the Soviet collapse, maybe is more adapted to the 21st century world and is looking to pursue a different direction. And if we just look at the last series of Soviet and Russian leaders, we see there's often a pretty strong break from one to the other. So Khrushchev was a strong break with Stalin. Brezhnev was a strong break with Khrushchev. Gorbachev was a very strong break with Brezhnev and Andropov and Chernenko. Yeltsin took a different path than the one that Gorbachev was on, and, and so on and so forth. So rulers might like to entrench a system and a group of personnel that's going to continue in the same vein and maintain their legacy. Uh, but history has a way of working out differently, as you know, as someone who's interested in history and leaders from outside of office or beyond the grave are not able to pull the strings anymore. Mm -hmm. So if you were advising uh, an American secretary of state or an American president on how to handle Putin, what would you say? I would say good luck. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we're in a situation now in U.S.-Russian relations that the ambitions should be modest and the spheres of potential cooperation are pretty limited and constrained. So there are important things that we can do with Russia in the area of nuclear arms control. And I think that'll be a priority if Biden is the next president. And even the Trump administration has shown some interest recently in extending the New START treaty. There are other global challenges and issues in which Russia has to be a player, things like climate change, things like the current global pandemic, uh, perhaps in some ways uh, terrorism, although we tend to see those issues somewhat differently. So that's a harder one. Uh, but I don't think we can look towards any sort of great new reset with Russia. And I think part of the problem is that we don't really trust them to act in good faith and they don't trust us to act in good faith. So in incidents like the Navalny poisoning or the poisoning of Sergei Skripal, the uh, attempted murder, although not successful, uh, of Sergei Skripal, a former Soviet spy in Great Britain, or the shooting down of the MH17 plane over Ukraine in 2014, U.S. intelligence has them caught to rights, and Russia just sort of continues to say, who us? Same thing about the 2016 electoral interference. And if you saw the uh, FBI uh, disclosures earlier this week about continued Russian hacking in a whole series of places, including uh, the Olympics, including the election in France, it seems clear that Russia is persisting with this behavior that most Western leaders consider inappropriate. And so it's hard to come to a common ground on Russia's relations, either with the U.S. or the West, given some of the behavior we've seen from Russia recently. Now, that being said, there, have to, there has to continue to be diplomacy. There always should be diplomacy uh, and dialogue and try to figure out ways to maybe lower the heat somewhat in this relationship. But finding a way to sort of lower the heat and live together is different than thinking we're going to build a new cooperative relationship. Right. And I think, uh, as as you talked about earlier, having knowing that the Russians have a, a, a particular lens with which to view the West uh, w with great suspicion, that kind of tempers uh, what what I, I think any progress that can be made in that relationship. That's right. I think if the Russian elite continue to believe that any time people go out in the streets in Russia, in Belarus, in Ukraine, in Kiev, or Moldova, or wherever, that this is something done to them by the United States as a way of weakening Russia, it's hard to um, make progress there because the fact of the matter is the U.S. doesn't really control what's happening on the streets in, in Belarus or wherever. And so if we're going to be blamed for it, we the U.S., but actually had nothing to do with it because the domestic grievances that are bringing people out, then it's hard to have a common framework of understanding uh, for the relationship. We can still kind of deal with geopolitical issues, but once we get into uh, 
uh, you know, the nature of the the leaderships in the countries around Russia, you know, that that's something that is for those countries to deal with and not something that we can agree over the heads of the local population with Russia. Right. And last question, just because it's always it's so discussed right now in the in the news, people are talking about it so much. What do people get right and wrong about uh, the stories of, of uh, election interference, whether it was four years ago or this year? So I think in terms of what there's broad consensus on is the fact that Russia interfered in 2016, that it interfered in a couple of ways, both through the social media kind of trolling campaign, but also, and I think more importantly, the hack and leak operation where they hacked DNC uh, and Clinton campaign emails and then release them strategically to affect the campaign. Those were the two most uh, important things. Uh, now I think we're we're seeing a, potentially at least a similar kind of misinformation campaign around the whole Hunter Biden thing that hasn't been proved, but there's at least suspicion that that Russia is involved uh, in, in that misinformation campaign. Uh, so I think. You know, much of what Russia is up to can be seen. And I think the part that people get wrong or at least jump to conclusions that we don't really know about are this more kind of extreme version in which not only was Russia helping Trump in 2016, but they somehow had control over him as some kind of hidden Russian agent. I I don't think there's a whole... I don't think there's enough evidence to draw that conclusion. So I would tend to be more restrained and say, yes, we know they did this social media interference. We know they did this hack and leak. We know they're continuing the social media campaign today. It's been documented. They've talked about it in Congress. The FBI has testified about it. But bigger stories about some kind of bigger conspiracy and Putin's hold over Trump and that kind of thing, we simply don't know what the evidence is. I mean, I think people think because... Russian money and money from other places in the former Soviet Union flowed into Trump properties, that therefore there's a lever there. But we don't have enough information about that to really draw any firm conclusions. Hmm. Well, thank you very much. The book is called Code of Putinism and uh, the author, Professor Brian Taylor from Syracuse University. Thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you, Richard. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. This American President is produced by myself, Richard Lim, and Michael Neal. If you like what you've been hearing, you can help us by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to our show. We are a proud partner of Evergreen Podcasts. Please visit evergreenpodcasts.com for more shows you might enjoy. I'm Richard Lim. We're back next time with more This American President.